Welcome to our lecture on genre theory, which um, has in part the goal of expanding what definitions and ideas you might have already in mind about genre, just as we did with literacy. So if we were to look up genre in the dictionary, um, it would basically tell you that genres are a system of classification, that they group texts into types, kinds, and forms. And while this isn't necessarily untrue, um, what I want to do here is give you an overview of genre theory um, and rhetoric and composition that moves beyond forms to thinking about how they're used. So, and maybe this photo is dating me a little bit. Um, if you were to go to um, a video rental store, or I guess also, you know, your Netflix page, um, or a library, um, we might think of genres as the headings on the shelves, right? Um, the comedy section, the drama section, the nonfiction section, the um, poetry section. Um, and while this isn't, you know, so this is probably where our mind first goes when we think about this term. Um, but this is kind of the old view, um, thinking of a genre as a container. Um, it's got, you know, as, as basically a thing that has particular formal characteristics. Um, in other words, um, something where the form is expected to look a certain way um, and the genre fits into it or it doesn't. And again, while it's, not, while it's not untrue that genres have formal patterns, they do. They have repeating characteristics that um, we um, recognize and in fact that kind of shape the expectations we bring to them. Right? We can think about genres partly as being defined by what we expect them to look like and do. Um, it doesn't tell the full story. Um, and so instead of just thinking about like the end product, but kind of also the process, how it's being used, um, the goal is to start thinking about um, how users interact with them, not just what they look like, how you know a critic might define them, but, but how everyday people kind of make use of them. So this gets a little theoretical, um, but here are a couple of ideas that I want you to just start chewing on a little bit um, because it'll help you start to think about that use idea. Um, genres we can think about um, as having basically um, social function um, and kind of being involved in action. Um, they shape our interactions with others. They organize kind of our sense of who we are. Um, the roles that we play in a community, for instance, our sense of ourselves and being, so, you know, our identities. Um, they help to dictate what is and isn't possible in a particular situation. So in other words, again, they kind of shape actions. And they also kind of help to organize us into communities and reveal the values and beliefs of those communities. Um, and then the last two ideas I kind of want to leave you with before I'll walk through an example to help you think about this is that genre classifications are multiple. Um, so we can, if we move beyond just like a very strict, you know, it has to look like this, gives us a little bit more flexibility to see how they might be defined in different ways depending on who's classifying or that, you know, there just might be endless kind of subgenres um, that we can use to classify them. Um, and also, one idea that um, I, I want you to come away with as well, um, and this is uh, based on work by Carolyn Miller, um, who I'll quote later, um, is that genres are basically some kind of typified or, you know, basically um, a pattern that's um, developed in response to a recurring situation or context. So situation happens over and over, and we have um, come up with um, very typified, recognizable responses to those situations. Um, we might even think of a street sign, like we see on this slide here, as a typified response to a recurring situation. Um, you know, they didn't always exist. Um, at one point, we had to start coming up with them to help organize, you know, how we drive. And um, they look different from state to state, um, even, you know, and especially from country to country. Um, and maybe some places don't have street signs. So, you know, we can think about them not just as something that's there, but as something that has been developed in response to a recurring situation. Um, to go back and just walk you through some of these ideas and kind of make them more concrete, because I know they're a little abstract. Um, if we think about a syllabus as a genre, it's not just a document that looks the same from class to class. In fact, you're gonna find a lot of different like visual differences 
but it's a document that functions the same from class to class. Um, it's something that you expect to see when you enter a college class, um, and it kind of shapes the um, social relations and who you are and who the teacher is. Um, you know, you can think about, for instance, how different syllabi, you know, especially when you read it before you've set foot in the room and met the teacher face to face, um, you probably get a certain impression of who that person is, if they're grumpy or not, if they're, you know, they seem old school or strict. And you can base that on the tone, you can base that, base that on the length, the specificity, the number of rules, the kinds of rules. Um, you know, it kind of shapes what kind of teacher that person becomes, right? It also kind of dictates what's possible for you as a student and kind of gives you different roles to play. Um, so it not only puts you in the position of student in the class, but also maybe group member in the class, right? Um, it kind of says, here's what you do to become an A student. Here's what you do to become a B student. Um, and this is not just done through like explicit, like do this, don't this kinds of rules, but just also through other parts of the syllabus. Um, you know, like the suggestions on how to contact the professor, for instance. We can think about how that shapes relationships between student and teacher. Um, and they also kind of, again, I guess the second idea I want, main idea I want you to come away with from this lecture, not just that we're going to think about use as opposed to only thinking about formal characteristics, but also um, how genres are kind of organizing documents are important for communities, for discourse communities. Um, and that's a term we're going to talk more about later this semester. Um, but you can think of any particular class you've taken as a discourse community. There are different values and beliefs from class to class. Um, and this isn't even just about different content areas, but think about different um, classes you've had in the same major, in the same field, that have felt very differently um, and have been or because partly because they've been organized in a different way and that comes in part from the syllabus. Um, I'm not saying that a genre, you know, is the only thing shaping, you know, relationships. It's not the only thing that shapes a community, but it plays a large role. Um, and it's kind of a reciprocal thing too. So it's not just this like completely deterministic document that does all this shaping. It's also shaped by the context. And that's kind of an interesting thing as well. And the reason we're talking about all of this really abstract theoretical stuff is because it's going to help you to think about ways to analyze these documents. So not just here's how they look, but also here's the community exists in. Here's what I think that community values. Um, you know, you can get a sense for the values of any particular class. Um, maybe punctuality is um, something that one class values over the other because, um, you know, lateness to class is mentioned in the attendance policy in one class and not in the other. Um, and that kind of gives you a sense for which class values punctuality more maybe. Um, does this class value, you know, creative thinking, um, things like that. You can get a sense for it not because necessarily there's an explicit statement we value creative thinking. I mean, there might be, but also based on reading between the lines, right? So this is how we start to tease in, out interesting things from analyzing a document, analyzing a genre. Um, and one thing that um, newer theories in rhetoric are doing with genre is talking about how we can category, we can do genre analysis on even um, what uh, Charles Bazerman calls humble genres or like everyday texts, not just on a work of art. So for instance, um, one recognizable example might be a greeting card. Um, they, um, you know, help to sanction or make more official particular holidays. I mean, you know, Christmas would exist without a greeting card, sure. But something like Grandparents' Day or Secretary's Day, those are in part made official by greeting cards. Other things help make them official, sure, but greeting part cards play a large role and maybe, um, you know, make them more official within a particular community. So maybe some communities celebrate, you know, particular days or holidays that others don't. And that's partly kind of determined by whether or not they exchange a greeting card for that situation. Um, they definitely have recognizable conventions and characteristics that we expect as um, readers 
right? So we expect that it's going to be a folded card, usually um, a message um, that may rhyme or be kind of poetic. And there's some variation, you know, depending on how specific we get about like the subgenres, you know, there's um, humorous ones and there's very sentimental ones. Um, but often, um, in general, there's going to be a message that may kind of rhyme or sounds a little bit like kind of poetic and there's space on the inside for you to write a message. We have these expectations about what they're typically going to look like and do. Um, and we can, you know, classify them in so many ways. So if you are analyzing greeting cards, right, um, you could think about, um, you know, there's not just birthday cards, but there's birthday cards for kids and there's birthday cards for adults and for women and for men and, you know, for, you know, moms and dads. Um, and they kind of, and this is one thing that's interesting about those like endless kinds of classifications that you could do if you really wanted to narrow it down is that they kind of help form relationships. So they kind of regulate the relationships we have with each other. And what I mean by that is that let's say you were um, sending a card to somebody you're dating. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of cards you could choose. You could choose one that's like very romantic and is talking about like, or, or let's say for like an anniversary or, or, or I don't know, but let's say um, for birthday for me, I might choose to send a card to um, my husband. And instead of saying it's like from, you know, my partner or my, you know, the person I'm just in a relationship with, maybe I choose to send the card that says, this is from your wife to my husband. Um, that kind of shapes the relationship we have a little bit. It says something about who I think he is, who I think I am, what I think our relationship looks like. Um, you know, I chose that instead of a card just to a family member or just to, you know, a random person, you know, because there are cards that aren't so differentiated and it's just a birthday card you could give to anybody. Um, it kind of says, you know, me choosing that card says something about who I imagine myself to be and who I imagine the other person to be. So that's an example of how just something as simple as a greeting card might help to shape a relationship and kind of performs a social action and also kind of helps form an identity. Um, we can go from the most humble, you know, like something like a grocery list to like, you know, a syllabus that we talked about or form at a doctor's office. Um, all of these texts, again, they're a typified or like a pattern of response to a recurring situation. They have conventions that we expect and recognize. Um, and they also kind of act in particular ways. Um, actually, I guess maybe I'll quickly walk through. Um, I won't go into as much detail, but let's take like the forms at the doctor's office, for instance. Um, those, I mean, so there's like a pragmatic, practical, you know, it gathers information the doctor needs to treat you and like needs for insurance, um, you know, uh, reasons and all of that and billing. Um, but we can also think of other things it does. If we were to um, do a genre analysis of a form at a doctor's office, we could think about the ways in which, um, for instance, it supports particular ideas about what medicine is, um, you know, particularly, I guess, in a Western context. So, for instance, if you go into a doctor's office and, um, you know, it's the first time, so you're filling out the form and it asks you about your symptoms, um, you know, it probably only asks you about physical symptoms or, um, you know, extreme kind of emotional distress like depression. It's not going to ask you about, um, you know, other parts of how you're feeling or thinking because in Western medicine, we kind of separate the mind and the body. Um, and that's not as true in other medical contexts. So that doesn't mean that, so in other words, like that doesn't have to be the way it is. And, you know, there are people who recognize um, links between how we think and how we feel. Um, but a doctor's office form kind of helps to replicate and um, support um, that Western medical ideology of the separation between mind and body. Um, if we look at something more humble like a grocery list, um, you know, on the surface, we can start with the fact that, of course, they kind of look a particular way. Sometimes it's a scrap of paper. It's usually small. I guess now maybe um, people start to use like phones and things like that. But if we just think about like a very traditional old school grocery list, um, if we think about who's using it, that changes what 
is on it, right? Um, it's harder to talk about, I guess, a discourse community with a grocery list because it's something that's used kind of so universally. Um, but then again, it also says something about um, the context we're in, right? Um, uh, it says whether or not, you know, you can tell by looking at a grocery list what, what kind of store a person's going to. Are they going to like a traditional supermarket or are they going to a farmer's market? Maybe, maybe we don't see, you know, processed food on that list and we know they're going somewhere else. Um, it's used in the context of, you know, our everyday lives, but there's probably other cultures and situations where the grocery list is not something that gets used because, um, you know, it also says something about like an American context because in some other countries, people um, buy their food fresh every day and they don't go like once every week or two to stock up like maybe um, many of us do here. Um, so looking at genres, we can start to get a sense for um, their use and also, you know, the values and beliefs behind the document held by the people who use them. Um, a couple major thinkers, again, genre, we've kind of gone, gone over that first definition as um, a recurring um, or a repeated pattern of social action that's associated with a recurring situation. Um, Amy Debit says something that I kind of started, kind of hinted at earlier, that there's a reciprocal relationship with context with genre. So genres can help create the context, but they're also created by the context. So it kind of goes both ways. And again, when we start looking at genres, the reason why it's interesting to analyze them is they tell us something about the patterns and the culture and the, pa and the values of the groups who use them. Um, and Anise Bawarshi tells us that... Um, to when we um, position ourselves in a genre, we um, you know enact identities, relationships, practices, um, and his book is the one that goes through that example of the greeting card I walked you through earlier, and we talked about there right how a greeting card and the one that you choose to send and use and the way in which you use it, you know, may, you know the kind of personal message you write. Sometimes people even cross out like the pre-printed messages there, right? That helps kind of determine, that kind of helps shape and regulate your identity, who you think you are, who you want to be to that person, right? Um, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very um, deliberate response, uh, ha can't talk, deliberate choice on the part of the greeting card sender usually, right? Whether to send one that's humorous or um, kind of um, casual and funny, um, you know, if it's not out, you know, if it's not making like an age joke on a birthday card, maybe it's just kind of making a lighter joke or maybe it's like really sincere and very um, sentimental. Um, and we choose those kinds of greeting cards because they kind of shape the relationships we have with other people. Um, so when we go to analyze a genre, um, we're essentially doing something very similar to rhetorical analysis, which is something that may be familiar if you took 1001 at UC or if you took a similar writing course elsewhere where you worked with rhetoric and you were thinking about how, um, how a text works and the kinds of uh, ways in which it persuades or sends a message, not just what it says, right? So you separated the moves it makes, the ways it persuades from um, just the content in that text. We're doing a similar thing when we analyze genre, um, um, except that you're kind of more attuned to how um, a text fits into a larger body of recurring texts, a larger body of patterns. Um, we're also thinking a lot about reader expectations. Um, what kind of expectations um, do readers have usually when they see this text? Um, if we go back to the um, example of the syllabus I mentioned earlier, I bet if I asked you right now to make a list, you could make a list of the sections that are included in most syllabi in college classes, right? There's usually contact info for the professor, where to find them, when to find them, how best to contact them, a description of the course and what you'll learn, a list of the materials you need, a list of um, policies for the classroom, um, a sense for how you'll be graded, um, a schedule that says what's due and when. These are things that you expect to see in a syllabus and um, partly, you know, those are included because of institutional demands, but partly those things are included because you expect to see them and you need them to function in the course. 
Um, and last, uh, the one point I want to drive home about how we analyze the genres, we also think about how they're situated in situate and rhetorical situations. The rhetorical situation is idea that we'll, we're talking about this semester. And basically, if I was to give a really brief definition, I'd just say that it has to do with just the whole context of a text, what's going on around it. So who creates it? Who uses it? Where is it used and how? Um, that is all part of the rhetorical situation of a text, right? The kind of background information about the text. Um, and, you know, that's useful for helping us to think about what kind of communities use them and then what those texts kind of finally say about um, who those communities are and what their values are. So again, genres are recognizable texts used in social contexts which organize and shape our relationships with each other and to the world.